So every year, four million kids put on smelly leather gloves, jog out in the middle of an empty field, and stand around for two hours. And this is an American pastime known as Little League Baseball. Sporting goods stores love it, parents kind of dread it, and kids see it as a good opportunity to, you know, chew too much bubble gum, get their pants dirty. And all these kids waste their time thinking they had a shot at the pros. And I was one of them. In the fifth grade, I could throw a nasty knuckle curveball. To give you an idea of what this pitch is, I could throw it uh, chest high towards a six foot two, appropriately named Tyler Little, have it flutter a couple times midair, and then drop to his knees at the last second. And it wasn't conventional for a young blood like me to throw a pitch like this. But when your five foot two, hairless frame can't exactly gun a fastball past kids with mustaches fuller than the one you can grow now, it's the sort of thing you need to add to your arsenal to stay competitive. So, despite this pitch, neither myself nor the North Baldwin Knights were any good at all. I mean, in two years, we had lost 54 consecutive league games without a single win. I kid you not. So the typical weekend for my dad would consist of driving me an hour along the uh, Jersey Turnpike to some grungy locations, probably featured in the Sopranos, watching his son get walloped in a doubleheader, and then being convinced to go to Burger King on the way home before checking in with mom. And uh, this frustration with my team's ability proliferated itself in my video game playing habits. I love playing big backyard baseball for PC, um, and I always played on easy mode. And I got all the good players on my team, you know, even the mythical creatures like Pablo Sanchez and Barry Bonds. And I would frequently win games 100 nothing. And it was this small dose of, of virtual therapy that was needed to help me cope with my sad baseball reality. The best example of our team's ineptitude, and also especially our indifference towards this ineptitude, was one road game against the Belleville Bears. So I don't know if this is rooted in science or not, but Italian kids seem to develop real quick. And the Belleville Bears might have been 12 years old, but I can swear that they arrived to the game by driving themselves, <laughs> along with their wives and kids. <laughs> So at, the, at this age, it's rare for kids to hit uh, over the fence home runs, but it wasn't rare at all for the Belleville Bears. The Belleville Bears had four that day. And these weren't four that just, you know, scraped over the wall. These were four towering shots that probably dented the pavement of the parking lot that they landed in upon their descent from the stratosphere. And thankfully, after three innings, we were losing 10 nothing. And I say thankfully because that means our league's mercy rule is enacted. And I meant the game was over and we lost. But before we went home, it was the birthdays of two kids on our team that weekend. So mother prepared two cakes. So while the Belleville Bears are leaving the field, you know, ready to drive home, get ready for the work week, they walked by a bleacher full of the losers they just trounced, standing up and celebrating with two cakes. <laughs> Happy as ever, as if, you know, they weren't even there for that despicable display of baseball that just occurred. I mean, we were bad, and it was hard to tell if we really cared, but eventually that 55th game came. Uh, it was the final inning. Uh, I was on the mound, struck out the first batter, struck out the second batter, and then it becomes your classic baseball story of one run game in the last inning, and there are two outs and two strikes on the batter. And for my, hopefully my final pitch, I threw my mic down the curve, and the batter hit it. He a slow rolling grounder to the shortstop. And the shortstop at this point was the coach's son. So as you can imagine, does the coach's son always deserve to be shortstop? Well, let's just say my faith and ability to throw the ball to first base was lacking. <laughs> so it comes to him, picks up the ball, throws it to first base, way over his head, way too high. But our first baseman leaps up, catches it, falls on his butt on the first base, just in time for the final out. So we won the game, the coaches come running out of the dugout, all of us go swarming first base. Meanwhile, this other team was just looking bewildered at us, like, this is the third game of the season. And all you guys are celebrating like you just won the World Series and broke a decades-long curse. I mean, it was, it was unsportsmanlike, to say the least. But, you know, whatever, we won. Our coach had to follow through this promise to bring us to the soda pop shop for ice cream uh, after our first win. So this day, it's hard to tell were we more excited for breaking this losing streak or for the promise of dessert. We'll never know. But surprisingly, we went on to be co-champions of the league that year, but my baseball career was dwindling to a close. Uh, my five foot six, still undeveloped frame didn't make the middle school baseball team. 
And it was at this point I was starting to realize that you can blow on every eyelash you wish on it, or every time the clock turns 11 11 you wish on it. But those forces in the universe still might not be strong enough to make a shortstop with the New York Yankees. And this is the first in life's trend of, you know, telling you to grow up, set more realistic goals for yourself. Um, in high school, I was a good swimmer. I wasn't good enough to swim in Division I college. Uh, in high school, I was a terrific student, and I think enough of us have enrolled at Penn to know what happens to that once you get here. But, you know, all this effort and time we invest in these things, where does it go in the end? Does it just up and vanish? Is it, is it gone? And then, you know, uh, when I think about these things, and it's, it's scary to think about, but, uh, you know, how many people in the audience today uh, uh, practice a musical instrument in elementary school and haven't picked it up in years to practice? Um, and how many of us studied so hard for the SATs um, and right now can't remember our super scores? Because, you know, once they added the writing component to that, it was hard enough to remember your score like a week after you took it because it got so confusing, but we definitely don't remember now. So, you know, where did this time and energy go? Um, it's scary to think about. And I was actually alleviated of a lot of those worries a couple months ago at the, the, the funeral of my Uncle Brian. Um, so if we look at it from like a LinkedIn perspective, right? Very successful businessman in London and Arkansas. Um, but when it came time for the people that mattered most to him, you know, his siblings, his loved ones, to speak about him, they didn't mention any of these things. They mentioned the time that he drove around in a golf cart dressed up as Santa, decked out in Christmas lights, just to make the kids in the neighborhood laugh. And they brought up all these moments that he was generous, loving, goofy, just to make the people he cared about laugh. And when it comes down to it, resumes won't be able to capture moments like these, but it's moments like these that really capture our lives and our values. So after all that time playing baseball, and that, you know, that uh, flower I always gave my mom on Mother's Day during the horribly timed Sunday afternoon Mother's Day baseball games. And um, all that time spent by, by my dad cringing at the North Caldwell Knights and its coaching staff. You know, they might not have led to that multi-million dollar professional sports contract that I definitely would have gotten had I just hit my books for a year earlier. But they're all part of my story. And for that, moments like these can never be wasted. Thank you.